going live. Okay. It can okay, be great. a delicate operation. Sometimes <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay. So now I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start the, the countdown clock. And then we'll have, let's see, share this. And I'm going to press. And we're, we are right actually, technically we are live right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we can continue to converse, but just know that everybody who is beginning to join the live stream can hear our conversation. And that, that limits it somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear some of the conversations you and Jeff had off camera. <laughs> so I saw you in uh, in Dr. Stephen Greer's uh, uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind this oh, last yeah. week uh, weekend. Just trying uh -huh. to catch up uh, in between, you know, pet visits uh, to the to the vet. But uh, you you've worked. I take it you've worked with Steve over the years. I've been involved oh, yeah. with him. I was, I was legal counsel for the Disclosure Project for twenty years. Got it. And so I got to meet and interview and vet all those witnesses and stuff, you know. And uh, was uh, general counsel with John Mack from nineteen ninety four to two thousand and four. Uh, for his uh, project on extraordinary experience research, his peer group. Uh, so, uh, so I've been, and then I was also legal counsel when Steve Bassett had the citizens hearings uh, in 2013, where we had former uh, retired now U.S. senators and and Congress people actually sitting in a panel interviewing some 40 witnesses, uh, which I got to vet. So, so I've been, I've just had this great time of getting to meet all these people, talk with them and, and kind of, you know, woodshed them uh, in preparation for whether they're going to be witnesses or not. So I got to do the kind of intense kind of cross-examination. I didn't, I didn't use psychological stress evaluators on them or anything, uh, but I, but I, I was digging in pretty intensely because, you know, I, I thought this was such an extraordinarily important issue that I didn't want to you know, present somebody who ended up, you know, just, you know, falling through the floor on, you know. Truly really is amazing, though, the, the vitriol. Uh, and I guess social media is that that's what it's known for. But even looking at some of the things that uh, that Stephen has produced, looking at the commentary, my goodness. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It's a it's it's not entirely different from it turns out a lot of other social justice issues because people people tend to be pretty ideological about it, you know? And so you get, uh, you know, just like any kind of group of progressives, you know, you get to meet people who, you know, some, and they fight with each other horizontally, you know, uh, intensely. Uh, and it's really unfortunate, you know, that uh, I, I remember that back when I first came out of law school and was, you know, being asked to help represent different groups and stuff like that. If you went and tried to help any one group you know, three other groups hated you forever, you know, that you were somehow, you know, a, you know, a, a Trotskyite or a, a Leninist or a, or, or a bleeding heart liberal, uh, or some people thought you were total, total in the tank with the CIA, if you had any sources that were, were there, you know, in the, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a kind of a luxury, I guess, that armchair uh, amateurs have. Uh, to to not have to be really professional about you know how they go about doing things, uh, which is not to disparage them because we're trying to encourage regular people you know to become involved and to try to develop you know opinions about things so that we can have intelligent you know sharing of different perspectives uh, and we we certainly have arrived at that place now uh, with regard to this issue. How was it working with Stephen Greer? <laughs> well, actually, we have an awful lot of people probably listening right now. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's one of those things when when you're legal counsel for someone. Uh, well, I was I was legal counsel actually for the disclosure project, mm. uh, and then it raises the question: is you know what is the relationship of the disclosure project to Stephen? You know how uh, what kind of a board is there? What kind of other independent judgments exist, uh, you know, and what is my relationship as legal counsel, uh, you know, to, you know, you're not, you're not required as a lawyer just to do whatever your client tells you to do, you know, or else you're not really providing adequate counsel to them. Uh, 
and so that uh, I, it was uh, for 20, 20 years from 2001 to 2021. Uh, I was legal counsel for the disclosure project for that entire time, and, and of course, got to know uh, got to know Stephen very, very well, and got to know all of his uh, supporters and all of his critics. So it was a it was a, a and it still is an interesting uh, an interesting relationship. So you're you're in regular contact with him now. Well, I, I, the last my last communication was when uh, back in. Uh, June, I think it was uh, of this year, when he brought in the the other the three additional new witnesses uh, that he held a a press conference at the National Press Club, you know, and uh, called me and asked me to come, uh, and uh, and had a group of lawyers mm -hmm. there trying to figure out you know how to protect the whistleblowers, et cetera, and so that was my my last set of conversations. Stephen got hurt. Uh, you know, pretty seriously, uh, in a, a bike accident, mm -hmm. uh, and he's been sort of uh, uh, convalescing for, mm -hmm. for the last few months. I see. I'll I'll be uh, right back. I'm just going to get some fresh tea before we begin. Okay. Danny, do you find it odd that um, today so many people seem to be focusing on the evil deep state? And yet for years, for decades, um, those those issues were not touched by this, by those of that kind of political proclivity, whether it was Iran-Contra or the Bay of Pigs or our assassination programs. It seems like there is this great interest in taking down the deep state because of the way it's affecting one politician, as opposed to a, a history of a shadow government. Yeah, right, right. No, no, it's. As you might guess, I, I find the entire thing quite uh, interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I was fortunate that when when I when I co-founded the Harvard Law Review, the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review, uh, back in 1968 at Harvard Law School uh, with Mark Green out of New York, uh, that uh, I ended up uh, starting to interview all kinds of people, uh, uh, and uh, I ended we ended up being asked to represent the NBC television journalist. Uh, in the case that ended up establishing the right of journalists to protect our confidential news sources. And so that I was immediately kind of tossed into that ocean of finding out the information that uh, investigative journalists had and who their sources were. Uh, and at that particular time, 1968, uh, it focused on the covert operations of the agency uh, because of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And the drug smuggling and the assassination, the Phoenix program, all of that stuff. Uh, and then when I, I ended up uh, initiating the case, the legal case that established the right of journalists to protect our confidential news sources. And because of that, I was uh, I reached out to by the Cahill firm uh, in New York City that represented NBC. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that they came to Harvard and recruited me. Because uh, because I was the one that had initiated the case, I was the first one to assert the First Amendment right of journalists to protect our confidential news sources. Uh, and in fact, uh, the the fellow the fellow Pappas John Pappas, who was the the New Bedford uh, NBC television journalist, wouldn't allow the Cahill firm to represent him <laughs> because they because they didn't believe in the right. You know, when he had first tried to get their protection. They told there isn't any such right. They don't know any. There's no precedent for any such right, and, and they wouldn't. They wouldn't protect him uh, against the subpoenas that have been issued to him by the grand jury in New Bedford. Uh, and so we came on at the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review, a fledgling law review at that time, and actually prepared all the motions for the uh, protective order from uh, from the judge that was overseeing the grand jury in New Bedford. It's a long case, but bottom line is, I end up at the Cahill firm. Uh, and in addition to doing the legal briefs for the for NBC at the Supreme Court on the issue, I did the briefs for New York Times and for for CBS and and, and ABC uh, and the Washington Post. And so I got to meet all of those folks, all their great general counsel. So Jim Goodell at the New York Times, when they got the Pentagon Papers from Dan Ellsberg that Neil Sheehan got, you know, I was the one that he called. Uh, because their law firm, their law firm, Lord Day and Lord, refused to represent them. 
and or said they were going to turn him into the FBI if they didn't bring the papers back right away. So uh, so Jim Goodell ended up calling me uh, to see if our Cahill firm that had done the was doing the NBC case would represent them. So there I was also then having access to the 47 volumes of the top secret Rand Corporation. So my 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 pathway sort of into this kind of covert world happened very quickly. Okay, we're live, and uh, the program begins. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Meshlove. I'm with the New Thinking Aloud co-host, Emmy Vadness, and our new guest host, Christopher Naughton, and our special guest for today's live stream, Danny Sheehan. Welcome, everybody. And I, I think, Danny, a, an appropriate place to start our discussion on preparing for disclosure is the fact that most of our viewers won't know, but there are closed door hearings that are about to take place in Washington right now dealing with the UFO topic. And although we're not likely to learn very much about these meetings, the very fact that they exist is significant. Oh, yeah. No, this is this is very far out, Jeffrey, that that uh, Tuesday morning, uh, you know, the, the, the Congress just came back on January 3rd from the extensive uh, holidays. And one of the last pieces of legislation that got passed uh, before the holidays was these, this uh, UFO Disclosure Act uh, that got passed on December 22nd. Uh, <laughs> then everybody leaves town and, and goes back for the holidays. And as soon as they've come back now, the, uh, the House uh, Oversight Committee uh, has uh, demanded a set of closed door hearings with, with people only with high level security clearances uh, on the committee. There are 48 people on the oversight committee in the House. Uh, only those with the, the, uh, the adequate security clearances are going to be allowed to participate in this hearing. But it's coming on Tuesday morning, uh, your day after tomorrow is coming on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, and they're bringing the the, uh, the inspector general of the intelligence community, uh, Thomas Monheim, uh, bringing him in to have to testify behind closed doors uh, under security wraps uh, about what it is that the uh, the inspector general has come to know about the UFO issue and what the activities of the uh, intelligence community, specifically and importantly, uh, the the uh, CIA but also the National Geospatial Intelligence uh, Agency, which people don't even know what that is. <laughs> that what the, the, you know, what it is they know about the UFO phenomenon uh, and about this non, non-human intelligence, as they keep referring to it, uh, as which we all normally refer to as the ETs, right? <laughs> uh, but anyways, but to have a, to have a closed door uh, classified hearing going on where the executive branch is being commanded by Congress to brief them up on the UFO issue uh, and about extraterrestrial intelligence going on behind closed doors, you would think is a pretty pretty major news item. <laughs> but but the, the the bottom line is that uh, that they're they're all more people are talking about whether they're going to fund the Ukraine or whether you know the administration is going to give enough money to the southern border security. And here, here going on on Capitol Hill behind closed doors is this uh, major high level secrecy meeting going on uh, about UFOs and extraterrestrial life. Uh, a pretty, pretty important issue, I would think. And I presume the, the inspector general and some of the other people who are scheduled to testify have already uh, in, in closed door hearings reviewed and approve the testimony of uh, whistleblowers such as uh, David Grush. Well, actually, the, one of the, l- the little known facts about the comparatively well-known subject now of David Grush having mm-hmm. testified in front of the Oversight Committee's uh, subcommittee on national security back on July 26th is the fact that he was authorized by the official uh, Defense Department uh, pre-publication uh, group uh, he was authorized to provide the information that he did, uh, stating that uh, our United States government was in possession of an intact, uh, operational, uh, extraterrestrial, non-human spacecraft. 
and in possession of biological evidence uh, pertaining to the non-human species that pilots these things. You know, again, you, you would have thought that that was going to blow the top off the roof of everybody. But the bottom line is uh, it uh, it didn't have as large an impact as one might thought might have thought it was going to, but it, it stirred things up pretty significantly. And I think it's ironic in, in, in a way that some elements of the government uh, are denying uh, any knowledge of this, which might well be the case, that, because uh, if it's an unauthorized uh, special access program or unacknowledged special access program, very few people, uh, even high levels of people in the military would be entitled to know about it. But on the other hand, uh, it's now approved by somebody that David Grush was was allowed to uh, speak publicly about these things. Yeah, and, well, it, it turns out that that, uh, that uh, Louis Elizondo, my client, uh, was authorized along with Christopher Mellon uh, back in 2017 to actually go to publish the videos, the very well known Tic Tac videos. You know uh, that uh, have now become very, very prominent. Uh, they were, in fact, authorized to to uh, those were not classified. They got those declassified, so that there's this this kind of covert game going on behind the scenes here. That there's some aspect to the Defense Department and intelligence community that is actually authorizing the drip drip kind of release of some of this information. Uh, and what Congress was trying to do uh, in the 64 page act that the Senate Intelligence Committee drafted up, you know, the, the UFO Control Disclosure Act, uh, was they were trying to establish a, a kind of comprehensive a set of protocols and procedures by means of which the actual disclosure of the information that some elements in the government have could be controlled. Uh, and have it be kind of a, 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 a choreographed process of rolling out this information. Uh, but the, but the uh, aerospace industry specifically, uh, you know, rose up on their collective hind legs and uh, stuck their thumb in the eye of everybody trying to get this done because they want to continue having completely secret possession of some of this technology. That has been uh, obtained from these uh, these spacecraft uh, UFOs, uh, and the the problem is they're trying to use it to make a weapon uh, that that is based on the technology, uh, particularly a missile that can be launched from the United States and strike into the heart of Russia or China in less than two minutes. Uh, it's a complete first strike weapon. Uh, you know, in the there there the, there's the the old Sufi saying. Uh, that you know, when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets. Uh, and what's happened here is the the military and the intelligence community, when they realized that we had recovered uh, a spacecraft, uh, an alien spacecraft, back in 1947 at Roswell, uh, they just kind of locked up and said, "Wow, look at this! We can make a great weapon out of this, maybe." <laughs> and so that we've got to just slam down on it and pretend that there's some horrible consequences will occur if we let anybody know that there's an extraterrestrial civilization coming to our planet. Let's let's instead uh, just make a weapon out of this and, and set up a whole secret program, which has been greatly detailed by Richard Dolan uh, in his big two volume work called UFOs in the National Security State, uh, where he presents the documented proof that there was this, this kind of reaction on the part of the intelligence community and the military at the time uh, to lock down on this and to try to, in fact, not only discredit anybody who tried to report issues about the UFOs uh, to the government and to whoever it is they thought they should tell, uh, and their lives were being destroyed. You know, they ruined their family life, they ruined their professional careers, uh, they threatened them, you know, with actually bodily harm to keep this secret. Uh, and this has gone on for like 75 years now uh, until just comparatively recently uh, when this there are people deep inside the program, kind of a new generation of people 
Uh, and a lot of those people have been uh, correctly offended uh, by this, uh, that this appears to be not only uh, bad policy, it's unconstitutional, you know, because they're lying actively to the members of Congress uh, who actually are the government of the United States. There are elected representatives and they're lying to, to the president. They've lied to presidents about this. So that this is a major constitutional crisis uh, of the caliber of the church committee hearings, you know, uh, when they investigated the uh, intelligence abuses of the Central Intelligence Agency under Senator Frank Church from Idaho, you know, uh, and also the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, and, and interestingly, I knew a lot about each one of those things uh, because, because I'm actually older than I look here. <laughs> you know, so I, was, I was actually actually involved in, in both of those events. Uh, and so I recognize the similarities here of what's going on with regard to the secrecy here in Congress trying to find out about it in the CIA and the covert operations people trying to conceal it. Uh, so we're we're back at it again. Uh, I guess I should really say still, you know, we're still trying to dig into this this kind of national security state or deep state that exists somewhere. Uh, we know that there's somebody calling the shots on this. But it, the trouble is, it ain't our elected representatives. So that's a problem that we've got to deal with. Danny, do you agree with the supposition? I, recently, there's a New York Times article that says, does the government want you to know that UFOs exist? And what I'm hearing from, I believe, from you and others that uh, have put together documentaries, which you, some of which you've been involved in, the government wants us to know, and they want us to be afraid of them. Well, it's interesting, as as you know, Christopher, the, the the reference to the government of the United States is 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 uh, not really a, a very helpful one because you have the three different branches of the government to begin with. And the founders back in 1789 set it up this way to have there there being some tension uh, between and among these three branches, uh, and so that and and especially since the passage of the National Security Act of 1947, at the end of World War II, uh, that from that point forward, uh, there was a national security state officially established in the United States uh, in this national security state pursuant to uh, Section 5412 of the National Security Act of 1947, uh, took it upon themselves to believe that they had the authority to engage in criminal activity uh, and covert operations and lie to the public uh, they, because they they originally started out being authorized to engage in these activities outside of the United States against foreign adversaries. But the problem is, as they spent years and years getting used to doing all of that, they decided to turn those same tools against their adversaries inside the country here and against senators like Frank Church uh, and Dick Clark of Iowa uh, and, uh, and others whom they've actively unseated. They've actually smuggled money in from South African banks, uh, specifically the Nugenhand Bank in, in Australia, and put secret financing into campaigns inside the United States to unseat critics uh, of their covert operations. Uh, and we've got a, a very, very serious problem here in, in the United States that has, in a certain sense, become the focal point of my legal practice you know, over the past 50 years. And the UFO issue is one of them. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why Luis Elizondo, uh, Luis Elizondo contacted me and retained me to be his lawyer uh, when he was the head of a program inside the Pentagon uh, that uh, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, uh, Harry Reid, had helped finance to try to get information uh, to the Congress about this. And that's what's happening right now. Tuesday morning, uh, we're going to have this kind of dramatic, even though closed door, uh, confrontation between the uh, legislative branch of the United States, our Congress, and this kind of element, this secret element. Because as it, as it turns out, not coincidentally, Thomas Monheim, who is the inspector general for the intelligence community, is the former general counsel for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which people don't even know what that is. I mean, if you, you know, people say, 
like when uh, AOC back in the hearing uh, in on July 26, when uh, David Grush was testifying, uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez asked him, "Say, well, where should we go to? Where should Congress go? What agency of the government should we go to to try to get this information?" Uh, and uh, the answer is, one of them is the National Geospatial Intelligence <laughs> Agency that no one knows what it was. Uh, and it turns out the fellow who is now the in charge of the Inspector General, the entire intelligence community, is the former legal counsel for that very group that was in charge of. Uh, outer space intelligence gathering, <laughs> you know, so he should know, he should know uh, a lot more than uh, than people uh, in Congress know. So hopefully they're going to get a bunch of information from him on Tuesday uh, and keep him there until he talks to him in detail about this. Well, you've used the term the deep state, and, and I hear it a lot. This is an election year, and I'm under the impression that uh, in general, members of the Republican Party use use the term, and they seem to insist that the deep state is out to destroy Donald Trump. Uh, I don't know whether that's true or not. I'm kind of skeptical uh, uh, about it. But uh, is is that deep state that the Republicans refer to in any way related to what you're talking about? Well, it, 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 not actually. You know what their, their their term their term when they use the deep state they're actually functionally referring to the kind of bureaucracies uh, the administrative state uh, where the executive branch has developed a whole set of executive agencies and there are bureaucrats who are, are lifelong uh, 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 directors in in those agencies and they garner unto themselves through the normal functioning of the bureaucratic imperative a certain type of power where it, they, they assert control and power and push back against presidents, push back against Congress, et cetera. You know, and, and that's sort of what they're talking about because the, the Republican Party, to the extent, and, and we're talking about the old Republican Party, <laughs> uh, the old Republican Party to, to, to some significant extent represents corporate interests, wealthy financial uh, elites, uh, and they resist regulation on the part of the government. Uh, and so that one of the things they resent the most is this kind of government regulation by these bureaucracies in the executive branch. Uh, and so that that's what they're talking about primarily, uh, that 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 bureaucratic under uh, uh, class inside the administrative agencies of the executive branch that are trying to over regulate the corporations and the banks and the, the pharmaceutical industry and other places. That's who they're talking about. That's not the same thing that I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about the the uh, criminal covert operations uh, dimensions of the American intelligence community uh, and to some extent in now in the Pentagon, because they have this whole office that they developed called the Joint Special Operations Command uh, inside the Pentagon that liaisons with the CIA constantly and provides uh, paramilitary support for covert operations that the CIA engages in. You know, in the CIA has you know, political assassination programs, you know, they have uh, all kinds of criminal covert operations going on. Uh, and they believe that they're completely above the law. Uh, and that the, that's a, a substantial constitutional problem that we have here. And, and that's who I'm talking about when I, you know, I should avoid probably using the term deep state, because it's been commandeered by the right wing elements in the Republican Party to be attacking the administrative state. Uh, Andy, do you think that about. shadow government might be uh, as differentiating between it and the deep uh, deep state, perhaps? That's right. Yeah, the shadow government, that, that's what we called it. You know, when uh, when we did the major federal uh, criminal racketeering prosecution against the off-the-shelf enterprise of Oliver North and Richard Secord and the other people, you know, back in eight, 1986 when we filed that, you know, that we referred to them as an element. We referred to them as the midnight soldiers of the shadow government. Uh, and so th that's that's the term that we actually coined uh, when we were we were doing that. And uh, it, it turns out that that this thing does exist. Uh, this element does exist. Uh, my I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly who the present uh, participants are in that kind of an elite tiny group of people that are pulling the strings behind the scenes right now. 
uh, and I, I engage in regular conversations with people that, that have bumped into it, you know, and we're, we're trying to look at it like the elephant in the room and the blind people trying to see, you know, uh, you know, what this is, you know, and who's in it right now. Uh, but I, I have no doubt that it exists. Uh, and I've, I've run into it. Uh, and, uh, and I've bumped into the walls of it. So I'm starting to get some kind of a sense of the demographic uh, parameters of this right now. But it's, it's very, very front and center in the UFO issue. Because the UFO secret uh, in the ET secret is considered to be the most guarded secret uh, of the national security state. We have questions coming in from our viewers. Uh, one viewer whose YouTube name is Court Mile asks, if you are preparing to file suits regarding any UFO technology or biologics and towards government departments, corporations, or entities. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm, is that, that uh, uh, Stephen Greer, uh, who we were talking about a little bit earlier before we came on the air, you know, that I was legal counsel for the Disclosure Project for 20 years, from 2001 to 2021. Uh, and Stephen, uh, I think because he saw how effective our, our Romero Institute was in bringing the major federal criminal racketeering lawsuit against uh, the off-the-shelf enterprise of, of Oliver North and Secord and the others, you know, uh, I thought that it would be a good idea to bring a federal criminal racketeering civil complaint against the bad guys uh, that, uh, but, but uh, uh, he, he has a, a different view, a broader view of who the bad guys are. And in a sense, he has a broader view of what that federal criminal racketeering enterprise would look like uh, than I. Uh, and uh, uh, what I've done is I've proposed that we utilize the principles uh, and protocols pursuant to which a legal team would in fact undertake a federal criminal racketeering act investigation uh, of what the group of people are that are doing what they're doing here. Uh, one of the challenges is, of course, is that you can't sue any government officials under the federal criminal racketeering act. This is a specific exception that J. Robert Blakey uh, wrote into the statute when he wrote it for the, for the Senate Judiciary Committee. So you can't sue government officials. But what you can do is you can sue the private people who are dealing with those government officials who don't have sovereign immunity. That is what we did in the in the uh, the Iran Contra uh, Iran Contra case. That's why we were as aggressively successful as we were in exposing that entire thing. What I'm proposing is that that we as investigators, citizen investigators, utilize the structures and concepts of the Federal Criminal Racketeering Act to conduct our investigations and to make the accusations that are important. Uh, I don't believe that there's any realistic uh, chance that the federal judicial branch uh, would in fact allow you to get at them uh, in the same way that we ran into substantial resistance from the, ju from the judicial branch itself in trying to get at the Iran-Contra case. Uh, you know, it turns out that the federal judge uh, that was sitting in that case down in the Southern District of Florida uh, James Lawrence King is a complete CIA trained lawyer, <laughs> and he he used to be he used to be on the board of directors of Meyer Lansky's uh, National Bank of uh, of Miami, which is a major mafia CIA bank. Uh, you know, so that the the steps that have been taken by the the uh, this shadow government to make sure that the judicial branch is full of appointees uh, that are there to guard the gates. Uh, for the national security state uh, are operative. And so I think that we should use the principles and policies and the procedures of, of mounting a major federal criminal racketeering act investigation against these people. But I don't believe that it's really worth our uh, time and effort that would be involved in trying to get the judicial branch to agree to it. So what we fo we're, fo we're focused on the legislative branch at the present time. Uh, and we believe that focusing specifically on the Senate Intelligence Committee, where you have a 17-person absolute total unanimous uh, vote uh, to, to pass the 64-page 
the UFO Disclosure Act. Uh, that's, that's the seat of the power here that we need to work with. And we're trying to establish a partnership now with the Oversight Committee in the House of Representatives. It's a little more unwieldy. There's 48 people <laughs> in that committee, uh, whereas there's only 17 people in the Senate Intelligence Committee. So it's a little easier to deal with them and their staff. Uh, but what we're trying to do is to get a, a cooperating alliance form between the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, controlled by the Democratic Party, and the, the House Oversight Committee, controlled by the Republicans, to have a, a unified position of both political parties, uh, at least the rational members, you know, of, of both political parties, uh, to, to join in and protect the constitutional uh, rights of the Congress of the United States, and thereby the rights of our citizens to actually find out about this. Uh, and that the, therefore, we're trying to take advantage of the separation of powers that is uh, a central core element of our constitution to, to place the legislative branch in an oversight role over the activities of the executive branch as was intended by the founders. So uh, as, a, as a, a constitutional scholar, uh, you know, be that as it may, but as a lawyer that was trained in constitutional law under Larry Tribe and uh, and, uh, and Paul Freund and others at Harvard Law School, you know, what I'm trying to do is bring the tools of, of constitutional scholarship to bear on this particular problem, which is not only the problem of the secrecy of the UFO subject itself, that was probably the most important aspect of it, but the whole problem of the national security state having gotten out of control, literally out from under the control of our elected representatives and even of some presidents. Uh, and we this is a, this is a manifestation of that problem uh, that's coming to roost. So there's actually a constitutional confrontation brewing uh, in Washington right now, but it's very much behind the scenes, kind of literally behind the closed doors. Now, that's going to be taking place on uh, on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So people ought to just keep their eye on who's coming in and out of that hearing <laughs> and see if we can get anybody to say anything about it, because it's going to be very important. Danny, before we went live, you were sharing with me that this is an issue that both sides of the political divide seem to come together on and actually communicate with each other on, whereas there are many issues that they don't and that maybe that will help create momentum around this. Mm. I, I hope so. I, I really do. That uh, I was extraordinarily impressed by the the unique degree of camaraderie, actually, between uh, disparate elements inside Congress, usually along the dividing lines of Republican versus Democratic Party. But mm -hmm. as you know, even inside the Republican Party, mm -hmm. there there has developed this this extreme right wing element inside the Republican Party that is at odds with the rest of the Republican Party. Uh, and, and they have some very important relationship, uh, at least with Donald Trump, but it's not exclusive to Donald Trump. I mean, so even if Donald Trump were to disappear tomorrow afternoon, there would still be this element uh, inside the Congress of the United States. Uh, but the irony is that a lot of those, the most conservative people in the Republican Party are some of the most ardent advocates <laughs> of trying to get at the UFO information uh, because they they are offended by the fact that even they, who are the arch nationalists, the 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 most ardent uh, people, uh, you know, championing the, the United States as the primary power of the whole planet, you know, they're totally offended by being explicitly read out of a program uh, like this. Uh, and so that you get this really interesting alliance now that's going on. Uh, and but for but for a couple of the fairly well placed people in the House of Representatives uh, who are basic spokespersons for the private aerospace industry, <laughs> who are fine, whose campaigns are financed by them, uh, you know, most virtually everybody else is uniformly in support of the passage of the 64 page. Uh, UFO Controlled Disclosure Campaign Act. You know, they, they want to have a campaign to roll out the information uh, about the UFO thing so that we can, as a, as a human family, start to adjust ourselves to accommodating this 
much, much broader perspective on reality uh, than, than all of the operative worldviews of our human family presently have. You know, because all, all of the, the, the entire spectrum of, of, uh, of human worldviews that are manifest, for example, in its political manifestation as the authoritarians, the reactionaries, the conservatives, the moderates, the liberals, the progressives, and the utopianists, you know, that that, that spread of, uh, of worldviews that is operative now, all of them share in common the feature that they all are based upon an assumption that our human species is the only sentient, intelligent species in the whole universe. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's pretty stark. It's pretty kind of frightening when you think about it. Uh, and so that we we have to we have to establish a new eighth worldview, uh, a post-contact, uh, a post-planetary confined uh, worldview. Uh, now for our whole human family, and it's going to in involve uh, theology and philosophy and metaphysics and the geopolitical structures of our planet, the economic system of our planet. You know, this is a profoundly important uh, period in our human family. Uh, and people are still fixated on, uh, we've sort of just started to get past whether UFOs are real. <laughs> you know, we, we've kind of uh, across that Rubicon where they're acknowledging that UFOs are real, but they're still trying to pretend that they don't know what they are. Uh, and they definitely know what they are. You know, that they are an extraterrestrial set of vehicles coming from different star systems, coming to our planet from civilizations that are non-human civilizations uh, that have, in fact, as much of a billion years, some of them four or five billion years more of uh, historical evolution than we have had on our planet. And it is extraordinarily important that we come to grips with this uh, so that our whole culture, our whole human culture doesn't sort of dissipate. Uh, in the face of this encounter, like the you know tiny island the tribe you know in this in the South Pacific in the 1950s that suddenly discovers that there's an outside world uh, in their entire primitive civilization collapses you know within months you know we we can't have that happen but that's not the primary risk that we have here the risk that we have here is that we we aren't we aren't going to preserve our constitutional democratic function. As a as a human species that we have evolved here on our planet, uh, we have to we have to make sure that we can make our constitutional system work here on our planet. If we have any hopes of preserving our fundamental individual rights uh, in the face of uh, of a different of a new civilization that that may not may not have adopted the same kind of importance on individual liberties that we do. Hmm. Wow, powerful stuff, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, there's a question that I've wanted to ask, and, and I don't think unless I became associated with Jeffrey and Emmy that I'd even think of asking this question. But since I've been exposed so much over the last few months, you know, two of the great mysteries of our of our generation generations has been the notion of UFOs and um, the secrecy around them and also JFK and the assassination. Yeah. And, I, you know, I don't know. And I want to ask you if there is a thread of evidence that suggests, as has been written on, and I don't know how strong the evidence is, that JFK, who wanted to break up the CIA in a thousand small pieces because he saw what happened at the Bay of Pigs and he saw what happened after he got through the October missile crisis and he saw what happened when he invited the Russians to perhaps work with us in outer space. Is there any evidence that you have seen any credible evidence that you have seen that ties this thread together, JFK, UFOs, and his assassination? Well, as, as it turns out, I, I happen to know a lot about that. <laughs> that that uh, the, the, the way in which this relates to it uh, and is being misinterpreted by people uh, who have a, a less kind of professional set of details about it all is this, is that what happened is when... Uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, it wasn't just the Bay, uh, the Bay of Pigs thing that gets a lot of ink because Kennedy, after that, was so irritated at Dulles and the others that he fired Dulles and said he was potentially going to break him into a thousand pieces. It was really the Cuban, uh, it was the Missile Crisis in October of 62. Uh, and then what happened is when uh, on June 5th, actually, uh, of 1962, uh, uh, that uh, President Kennedy 
uh, or June 5th of 1963, rather, uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, that he found out, that was the first time he found out that there was actually a political assassination team uh, that was operational deep within the operations director to the Central Intelligence Agency to attempt to try to assassinate Fidel Castro. Uh, ironically, on that same day, uh, June 5th of 1963, uh, Kennedy demanded a full briefing on the UFO issue. Uh, and uh, he was planning to provide this information uh, to Khrushchev because he had been engaged in, this is important to, to understand, that uh, following the, the uh, Bay of Pigs, uh, excuse me, following the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, in October of 1962, uh, when we came within minutes, really, uh, of having a total thermonuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. Both President Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of the Soviet Union at the time, were so personally traumatized by how close they came to destroying the entire civilization that they began to exchange a series of uh, secret letters back and forth, 18 separate exchanges of letters. Uh, they, they were being carried by a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Cousins, his name, Norman Cousins, was actually transporting these secret letters back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and the CIA found out about it uh, because the, Kennedy didn't trust the CIA. Uh, and so he was doing this completely privately. And Khrushchev and Kennedy were having this, a, a, a letter exchange planning to start to disassemble the nuclear warheads. Uh, of both the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, and they were they're going to be exercising their respective executive authority to start doing this. Uh, and they were actually talking about having uh, Pope John the 23rd be the broker mm. of this and to ensure that it was being followed up upon. Uh, and as soon as the, the agency found out that, that he was doing that, there's this, a, por a portion of this, uh, this deep, uh, element that we're talking about this the core of the national security state is a group called the the china lobby they call them uh and that that they absolutely were opposed to getting rid of our thermonuclear weapons because they thought they needed those to deal with china uh that uh and this is what gorbachev said to us when we talked to him directly about this uh i don't get too far out saying but but we were in direct communications with gorbachev through our Jesuit headquarters, when I was general counsel at the Jesuit headquarters in their social ministry office, about trying to disassemble the nuclear warheads to, to see if we could get back onto this track that uh, Kennedy and Gorbachev, uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev had been on. Uh, and he said to us, he said that you're never going to get the United States to agree to disband their nuclear weapons, he says, because they they believe they have to have them, not against us, he said, in the Soviet Union. China, he said. The, the Chinese showed showed uh, 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 the United States at Incheon that uh, that they could put a billion men uh, into uniform on the field in any kind of traditional military engagement with the United States. And so the United States knows that it cannot have a traditional land war against China, uh, that they need the nuclear missiles, and they'll never let go of those. And, and, and Gorbachev said that directly to us in our conversations with him, you know, and so that what, what happened is when Kennedy uh, and Khrushchev started having these kind of secret communications about disassembling the nuclear warheads, uh, the China lobby element inside the, the national security state, uh, which is centered primarily at a place called Brown Brothers Harriman. Brown Brothers Harriman was a, uh, a private investment group uh, made up of the, the major dozen uh, super uh, wealthy families uh, the, that were actually the robber barons, you know, the Carnegies and the and the Rockefellers and the the uh, Harrimans with the rail lines and uh, and they they would come together regularly at Brown Brothers Harriman uh, to plot how they were going to run the world. Uh, and the CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman was George Herbert Walker, uh, who was the the maternal grandfather of George Herbert Walker Bush and the great, great maternal grandfather of George W. Walker Bush. You know, and this, this group of people, the legal counsel for the, for the Brown Brothers Harriman was Alan Dulles. 
who was made the first civilian head of the Central Intelligence Agency. And the Central Intelligence Agency was created by Truman at the behest of uh, Brown Brothers Harriman, basically. That Robert Lovett, who was a senior partner of Brown Brothers Harriman, wrote the letter to Truman advising that we create this Central Intelligence Agency. And so that what we what we what we discovered happened is that that uh, that when when Kennedy res resolved that he was going to be trying to establish a peaceful relationship with the with the Soviet Union and and disassemble the nuclear warheads, he realized that the place that we could have our greatest companionship with the Soviet Union is in outer space. That we could join together to not militarize outer space, but to have a civilian human development of, of our space programs. And so he was offering to have a joint space program with the, so with the Soviet Union. And in that context, uh, uh, on June 5th of 1963, he demanded to be briefed up on all of the information about the UFOs, which he clearly intended to share with Khrushchev. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't that that got him assassinated. It was the intention to disassemble the nuclear warheads of the United States, along with with the Soviet Union, uh, that's what uh, triggered it. Uh, and uh, and uh, Alan Dulles, you know, sort of coordinated that whole assassination program, not because he was upset about having been fired as the head of the CIA over the Bay of Pigs, but because he was legal counsel or consigliere for Brown Brothers Harriman. That entire assemblage of extraordinarily wealthy uh, kind of patrons. Uh, that are part of that whole uh, deep element uh, that has been thinking that they've been entitled to run the world ever since Cecil Rhodes, you know, came up with the idea that they ought to have this elite secret culture of society uh, that run the world. Uh, and that's what they're, that's what happened to him. Uh, and I don't, I don't believe that the driver turned around and shot him. I don't believe that he was accidentally shot by one of the guys carrying the M16. You know, it was a, it was a cabal. Uh, the mm -hmm. same one, J. Robert Blakey ends up in, in Dick Billings, uh, the chief of staff for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, uh, both concluded had done it. You know, it was, a, it, as they put it in the, the report, the assassinations report, the, not the Warren report, of course, which was under the whip hand of Alan Dulles, you know, but the, the independent uh, report of the, Senate select, uh, the House and Senate Joint Select Committee on uh, Assassinations you know, they concluded that President Kennedy was assassinated by a conspiracy. Uh, and, and that conspiracy more likely than not involved a certain element of organized crime, which I know who they are in detail, uh, and, uh, and a certain element uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Miami anti-Castro Cubans in Miami. Mm -hmm. I know who they are. I know who the 15 people were that were on the team that assassinated him. I know that Roger Morales was the shooter from the Grassy Knoll. But the fact is, that Lee Harvey Oswald was part of them. You know, it wasn't that he was just some kind of innocent guy that happened to be in the neighborhood. You know, I mean, that this this was a guy that was working very closely with Guy Bannister and the other guys in New Orleans, uh, which as you know, Jim Garrison down there got a little piece of, but he didn't have a handle on it well. Uh, you know, but the bottom line is, it, it wasn't uh, the, the, it wasn't any kind of approximate causation for his assassination his desire to turn over information about UFOs and stuff to Prusa, it was his desire, desire to disassemble the nuclear warheads. Thank For you. For the short answer to your question. Yeah. <laughs> right. Good one. Great history lesson. Right. We have another question from a viewer, Eduardo Tavares, who wants to know uh, what you believe with any measure of certainty if we were to look back, let's say one year from today, what will we in the general public know then about UFOs that we don't know now? I don't think, I think that the, the turmoil that is anticipated around the 2024 election here, uh, that when we're, when we're only talking about the next one year into our future here, you know, I mean, that, that we've got like four different uh, criminal trials coming up for for Trump. We've got a, civ a civil trial coming up against him. You know, there are 91 separate criminal charges made against him. Uh, and he's still going to be, you know, 95% probable he's going to be the Republican Party nominee for the presidency. Uh, we got Joe Biden, 
uh, is, uh, you know, 95% probability he's going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party. So all that, all that rustling around about who, you know, the debates among all the other candidates for the no nomination in the Republican Party, the effort on the part of the Democratic National Committee to keep Robert Kennedy Jr. from being able to engage in any debates. All of that's just a total sideshow. You know, we know that the confrontation is going to be between Trump and uh, and uh, Biden. Uh, and we we know that uh, it's virtually certain that the rolling out of the evidence against Trump uh, on the part of his closest Republican confidants, you know, revealing how completely incompetent, irresponsible uh, and unconstitutional he is, is going to have a major adverse uh, impact on Trump and his popularity. Uh, and so that that uh, Biden is likely to win uh, in that that confrontation. I don't think Bobby is going to be able to carve into the popular vote uh, adequately to keep Biden from from getting the 270 electoral votes that he needs to have. Uh, and I don't think that Manchin, uh, even if he does, which I think he probably will, uh, join with uh, with uh, uh, Cheney, with Liz Cheney to form this, you know, no labels kind of uh, competitor to the to both to both uh, uh, Trump and Biden. Uh, so I think Biden's going to win uh, and Biden will come into his second term. Uh, and the the uh, that's when yeah. that's when things are going to start getting interesting. So it's like a whole year away. <laughs> That whole year that the questioner asks about is going to be filled with that kind of turmoil, and, uh, and there'll be things going on behind closed doors, like the Tuesday hearing that's coming up, uh, where there's there's going to be efforts on the part of Congress to get their feet down on exactly what this issue is and how much, uh, who knows about it, and what's the state of the technology, how 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 much uh, have they advanced in in back engineering some of this technology, uh, in how deeply is it buried into the weapons systems thing. Uh, uh, and so all of that's going to be going on for this one year. But once the once the the uh, the turmoil comes down, and I think that the the support for Trump will have been driven to such a low level by the time you actually get the results of the election, you know, in November mm -hmm. of of this year, uh, that it's going to tamp down considerably the percentage of people in the country that are willing to take up arms or to get in the streets and try to burn things down over the fact that he's lost the election, you know? And so I think that there's going to, and whatever degree of planning there is to do anything like that is going to be set upon by the Justice Department pretty aggressively to shut that whole thing down. Uh, you know, they've got all those names of all the different people that have already been prosecuted and they're in their intelligence list. So they're going to quell that thing pretty quickly. And then the, the, the real interesting thing is over the next four years, which is the swan song of a Biden, you know, the, the, his his last term in office, you know, since the time he was 29 years old. You know, I mean, we're, we're dealing with a, a, of an epoch of American history here from the time that Biden came in at the age of 29 to the point where he leaves at the age of 85 or something uh, as the president. In that entire four year period is going to be transitioning to a younger, more progressive Democratic Party. Uh, because of the shambles that the Republican Party is going to be in. They're going to be substantially disempowered uh, during that four-year period coming out of the election. Uh, and that you're going to have a shift toward the Progressive Caucus. You know, the, ca the pro Progressive Caucus is the largest single caucus in the entire Congress. Uh, and there's going to be a shift toward them. So there's the Democratic Party is going to have to kind of repopulate the Democratic National Committee to be open to a more progressive agenda. Uh, and that's going to happen. Uh, and the UFO thing is going to be part of that. OK, it'll drop into line with, you know, trying to shift our economy from a, uh, a supply side economic policy to a, a demand side economic policy, you know, that uh, that is talked about by the economists. Uh, uh, and it's going to shift over into trying to utilize the instrumentalities of our government more on behalf of our people rather than on behalf of our corporations uh, and the elite, uh, you know, with special tax deductions and, uh, and exemptions for them and everything. So I think that the, the UFO issue is going to start taking its place in the midst of that transition, that four-year transition. So the much more salient question is, you know, what do we see happening in that four-year period uh, between January of, of 2025 you know, all the way to 2028, 
you know, in that election. Uh, and I think that you're going to see this rolling into place as a as a uh, a, uh, a logical discussion, a discussion that is like many other kinds of discussions. And what I hope is we can maintain the completely bipartisan support uh, in the Congress for extracting that information and then getting people appointed into the executive branch during that four year period from January 1st of 2025 uh, or January 21st of, of 2025 all the way through to the next election that we can get people in the executive branch who are going to cooperate and participate uh, in sharing this information with Congress. And that we're going to be able to get the other 40 pages of the Senate bill, the 64 page bill that they drafted uh, into the 24 page bill that got approved by the House. And it's gonna have enforcement mechanisms, timelines, protocols, and there's going to become a, a reasonable administrative process pursuant to which that information is going to be handed over, then the issue of how much is going to be exposed to the American people and therefore to the world is going to be a campaign issue in 2028. Okay? Uh, and I can personally assure you that that's going to happen <laughs> because that's what we're doing. Uh, the, the New Paradigm Institute, uh, oh, which by the way, I'm supposed to say, talk about because my my staff is saying, look, you got to tell people to contact the new paradigm uh, and you can participate in putting pressure on the Congress people, actually putting putting air under their wings because they're already very much wanting to get this done. But show the kind of support that we have for them doing this. And then we're going to be making this a major campaign issue about when the, the new president and who the president is going to be appointing to fill out these executive posts uh, in the new administration in 2028. These have got to be people that support turning over the information completely to Congress and setting up the next stage of our whole human family in coming to grips with having to have a new paradigm worldview. We have to have a new paradigm worldview that integrates the reality that we're not only not at the geophysical center of the universe, which we sort of got past with Copernicus and Galileo. Uh, but, but the fact is we're not at the apex of the pyramid of all sentient life in the universe, which was the kind of model that we replaced that false model with. Uh, and so we, we're gonna have to have a, a, a new worldview that, uh, that has a, a role to be played by the major churches and synagogues and, and temples, because they're going to have to start inviting in the laity into the secrets of our, our mystical sciences as a human family, about the capacities of our human family, about the, the teleportation abilities, the, the telepathic communication capabilities, the kind of transmutation, transmutation of matter, you know? Uh, there's all kinds of capabilities that our human family has the capacity that are kind of hidden in the kind of elite circles of the churches and religious communities and secret societies that we're gonna have to open up that whole uh, world into sharing that with the laity so that we can come to understand that our human family, I guess I might put it this way, is much more worthy <laughs> of, of uh, partnership with the people uh, in, a, in a galactic civilization than we've been told. Uh, okay. And so that, but what's going to have to happen is the elite that have been safeguarding those secrets uh, are also going to have to let go of some of that. And, and allow an expansion of the consciousness of our whole human family and, and train people to, to develop the capacities and the faculties that we have that are, that are still secret, you know, uh, or I, I guess what they call them is esoteric, you know, uh, but, but th 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 those are, that's the dynamic that's going to have to start taking place. Now we're talking about, uh, interestingly enough, is in, you know, after the elections in 2028, we're talking about what what is this administration going to look like in January of 2029, you know? And, and what are they going to be doing about global climate change? What are they going to be doing about nuclear disarmament? What are they going to be doing about altering the economy of our, of our society to a more social democratic uh, demand side economy? Uh, how's it going to affect the geopolitical structures of our planet? What impacts are going to have on the United Nations? These are all the things that we need to keep talking about. I mean, I'm delighted uh, to get to participate in that uh, as the New Paradigm Institute, uh, because you know every single thing I've ever done for the last 50 years has all led to this, of, of being able to know the answers, for example, to the questions that you're asking, which are all salient. <laughs> but th this is the world that I live in every day. 
Uh, and, and so we're putting the staff together uh, and people are coming on board that virtually every one of the shows that I get to talk to people about this, I ask them to contact newparadigminstitute.org. And we've got thousands and thousands of people contacting us saying, what can I do? How can I participate in this? What can I help? How can I help you do this? So we're staffing out. Uh, we've got we've got the one of the only civilian office basically uh, inside the federal enclave on Capitol Hill. We're right there on Capitol Hill. Our office is right next door to the Senate Intelligence Committee. You know, literally across the street from the Supreme Court of the United States and the Congress, uh, where we're holding hearings. We're getting set to convene a major summit conference uh, of virtually all of the major major players uh, in this. Uh, and become a center for the collection of this information and sharing all the information that we already have with the American people in a way that it's not a kind of a strange esoteric subject that is just, you know, tune into, you know, ancient aliens, you know, and, and see what they think about the pyramids. You know, I mean, we're, we're, I don't mean to be disparaging about them because I'm going to actually be on their show pretty soon, I guess. But, but the, <laughs> the, the, the bottom line is we have to treat this as like any other issue that we have to deal with, only it's more so uh, than most any other issue that we've had to deal with in our lifetimes. You know, but that's that's what I think the the, the right question to ask is what is what's going to happen between the 2024 election uh, when we come out of that between then and the next election? That's where the real coming forward of the UFO information is going to take place. Well, at the same time, you uh, suggest that you're in touch with a lot of whistleblowers, and the whistleblowers seem to me for the last seven, eight years have, have been driving the conversation. Don't you think that'll continue? Yes. The, well, actually, how it's, it's going to work is, is the the availability of the whistleblowers and the degree of willingness of the Senate Intelligence Committee to participate with the House Oversight Committee in bringing forward these whistleblowers and having public hearings that are like the July 26th hearing where David Grush came forward and was authorized to tell the world that we're in possession of an intact alien spacecraft uh, and biological evidence of the non-human species that are piloting them. That we have, as we begin to have a, a series of those, that's going to be viewed in Washington as putting pressure on the people who had opposed the controlled disclosure process. <laughs> They're saying, okay, if you don't want this, if you don't want the controlled disclosure process, you're going to be threatened with what they keep referring to as catastrophic disclosure. <clears throat> That's their own term, you know, and uh, and people keep asking me, well, what would that look like? You know, uh, I don't think it's going to look like, oh, they're all going to open up all of the, the tombs and show you all the information about it. You know, uh, here, let's take you on a tour through the Vatican archives, you know, of all their information about UFOs. You know, what they're going to do is they're going to apply pressure one whistleblower at a time. One in the House, one in the Senate, then another one in the House, another one in the Senate. And they're going to be putting pressure on the opponents of the Controlled Disclosure Act. Uh, and so I think that we're going to see more and more support being generated for the Disclosure Act. Uh, and it's not that it's being driven by the whistleblowers themselves, uh, because you remember both both Louis Elizondo and and Chris Mellon and uh, and David Grush were all authorized by the infrastructure of the Defense Department to say what they said. Uh, and so what we have to do is accelerate that process uh, so that the matrix of players that are involved in this thing can basically isolate that tiny group of people whom we refer to as the legacy group. You know, mm -hmm. we need to isolate that legacy group because they're they're coincidental, coincident with the elite that we're talking about that run the national security state. It's not just the UFO issue that they sit on top of. You know, they, they sit on top of all the other major secrets uh, that we need to we need to get unfolded here. Uh, and so I think that that I think we're building a coalition of government operations people uh, to isolate that group of people and take control of the UFO issue. And with it, take control of our culture, take control of our history, uh, take control of our species, you know, and take it away from those people and put it into more democratic hands. 
I think that's the, the process that we see the beginnings of now. Mm -hmm. And there's a viewer who is TL who's on that point is asking what motivated the government agents to have Elizondo and Mellon release the Tic Tac UFO videos. Well, it, it, that's that's extremely interesting. Uh, uh, and and uh, some of this, I have to be careful. About, some of this entails, you know, attorney client information uh, because I represent Luis Elizondo. Uh, and uh, a lot of the information that I've gotten has been in the context of what you might call attorney work product, you know, of getting to talk to people that he puts me in touch with uh, who have security clearances. And I always make it a point that, you know, that I'm not to be told any information that would violate their security clearances, but I can ask them questions about what their judgment is based on everything they know about a particular issue. Uh, and while still self safeguarding uh, their national security uh, promises, I'm able to formulate kind of a, a vision of, of what it is that's going on. And, and the reality is that there, uh, there is a, uh, a uh, what, uh, I guess you can call it the invisible college. <laughs> that, that's the term they use. There's an invisible college of, uh, of uh, associates inside the intelligence community, inside the Congress inside the uh, economic structures who think it's time to bring for bring forward this information uh, and that uh, they're different than the legacy group that are dug in uh, and trying to preserve this, who are basically under the auspices of the private aerospace industry right now mm -hmm. uh, and the major financial institutions, the major bankers that are betting on getting, uh, pro uh, you know, uh, patent rights on this technology. You know, we're trying to isolate them into a smaller and smaller group. Uh, and so there is there is this invisible college that is participating in giving the sign that they're supposed to say this uh, and that the people inside the the uh, group inside the Pentagon that does pre-publication authorization for things. They're they're responsive to that. <clears throat> and so that's uh, that's what's happening now. Uh, and so I, I think that there's a uh, th this thing has just begun. It's just begun with Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon uh, and with, with David Grush. And there's now 40 other <clears throat> folks lined up uh, who we've set up the whole process where they come over to the Senate Intelligence Committee and they brief them. They don't go to Arrow. You know, Arrow got set up, the, the all-domain anomalous uh, 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 group, the office that they have set up. It's all under the auspices of the Secretary of Defense and the, the Director of National Intelligence. Those are the people that have been keeping a secret all this time. So the whistleblowers don't trust them. So that's not working. You know, they're, they're, they're not going there. They're going to the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, and so we have the 40 people uh, available. Uh, and what we're doing now is trying to establish this relationship between the House Oversight Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee to kind of work with these whistleblowers and make decisions as to how and when they're going to be bringing forth this information, which is all, as I said, by way of putting pressure on the opponents of the of the full disclosure process. <clears throat> and as, as more and more of those whistleblowers come forward, you're going to get people on the other side saying, okay, 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 let's get back to the 40, let's get back to the 64 page bill and set up this process over a seven year period where we'll roll out this information through, in their words, a, a UFO controlled disclosure campaign plan. I mean, that is the term of art that is actually in the Senate bill. And I think that that's gonna uh, start coming into place. But as I say, it's gonna be going on primarily behind closed doors for this whole next year. While on the public surface, there's all kinds of turmoil with regard to the election process. <clears throat> Yeah, get something to drink. Yep. Wow, you're sharing so much. So it sounds like there are some efforts to perhaps slowly release some of this information to the public. And I know you can only share so much information. And we uh, are <clears throat> have gone for about an hour. We've got just about 25 minutes left here on the live stream. And Again, we respect there's only so much you can share. What do you think when disclosure happens or as it continues to happen, what do you think we'll learn that we will either confirm what some of us already know or that might be new information for the to the public? 
well, there, there's probably a finer point on whether to distinguish from just new to perhaps the most important. <laughs> yeah, tell us the most important. Uh, okay. Uh, I think what, what will be discovered is that, that well, on the one hand, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the churches and synagogues and temples elite have been keeping secret from the laity the fact that, that we our human family have these additional capacities uh, that are experienced as mystical engagements and uh, unitive uh, uh, prophecy abilities and all these kind of things that our human family has. Uh, I think that that's going to be one of the most important direct impacts of all of this, that it's going to, it's going to uh, uh, stimulate the churches and synagogues in order to try to get out ahead of this issue and to salvage uh, their credibility to show, uh, as, as Father Father Davis used to say to me, the Jesuit headquarters by Superior, he says, uh, whenever there's this major new revelation that takes place, the Catholic Church is always ready to say, as we've always taught. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they, 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 so, well, we've always talked about the fact that we have mystics, you know, the Trappist monks, and that they they levitate, you know, and they do these weird things uh, uh, and can prognosticate and, and everything. Uh, we've always known that, uh, and, uh, and the reason we didn't really share it with the laity is because they were too busy, you know, or they had better other things to do. You know, well, that, that's not true. The reason they kept it secret is because it was power. Uh, and, and so that I think that one of the most important impacts of this entire thing is going to be, as it turns out, that the, the entire realm of religion uh, in our human family, uh, the, the Latin root of which is religare, which is to relink, is to relink our individuated sense of our personal individualized self back into the unitive experience of the infinite and eternal sea of completely undifferentiated consciousness that is the source of our universe, you know, that, that actually enfolded into being the material universe that we're all part of. Uh, and these are this is high mystical science that we're talking about here. Uh, well, it turns out it's the same as science. <laughs> it it actually is. Uh, and that what you're going to see is, you know, this trite discussion that's going on is that science and, and religion are now coming closer and closer together. Well, it turns out, to no one's great surprise, is that they're coterminous. Uh, that, that, that the mystical sciences are what is why the encounter that we're having with the UFO beings take on such a kind of a mystical, uh, mysterious, magical kind of quality. Uh, and it's one of the principal features of the encounter with UFOs. Uh, they walk through walls, they levitate, they, they, uh, you know, they tell people about the future. You know, they, they do all these kind of things. Uh, and, disappear, uh, and disappear and reappear. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. All that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the, the reductionist kind of perception of this is, oh, well, does that mean that Mary, uh, when she appeared at, you know, Fatima, is really a UFO person, you know, possibly from the Pleiades? That's all reductionist uh, analysis. Uh, and, and what we've got to do now is we've got to help train up our people, train our, and I don't mean to be patronizing, but we have to all participate in helping to share the information with the regular laity of all of our, our different traditions and elevate their consciousness so that people are now included in on this big secret. You know, I mean, Jeffrey has written the whole book you know, the whole roots of consciousness. Here, let's give everybody the book and say, take a look at this. There's a whole bunch of information that you didn't know about. You know, which everybody would think, oh, that's so woo-woo, you know. Uh, but now you got Congress, I say, we'll say, by the way, you got Congress having closed door classified hearings now about all this. You know, you ought to get involved in this. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be the largest kind of immediately discernible impact uh, of the entire thing with UFO. Is this going to, it's going to let people know that what they've been taught about religions turns out to be true to a great to a great surprise of the entire rising agnostic and atheist community uh, among the intelligentsia. Uh, it's true, but it's true in a very different way than you thought, uh, you know, which, which is exactly what, what one of the one of the Project Blue Book guys on his deathbed uh, said to me. You know, when he called me and said he was dying, he wanted me to come and see him. and He wanted to tell me something. So I went and sat down with him uh, and he told me about him and his commander, Project Blue Book, having been taken to S4 uh, 
you know, and uh, and actually got to see a live extraterrestrial being that was there. Uh, and his commander went in and had a telepathic kind of communication with him. This guy wouldn't go near him because he thought he was demonic. <laughs> and, and so he, he stayed away from him. Uh, but he reviewed these uh, three by five index cards that had notes and stuff from his interviews that they were interviewing this this being. And uh, when when he was he was asked, you know, uh, why why are they coming here? What's going on? And he said that uh, well, literally the dying guy told me that what the card said <laughs> was that that uh, he was part of this being was part of a uh, an interstellar uh, group from inside our galaxy uh, that there were beings from different star systems that were together in the group and they were going around to all the different planets in our galaxy uh, surveying what the state of evolution was of the different life forms that were on the different planets and the uh, the the air force colonel that was interrogating him or interviewing him <clears throat> said well you know who's in charge of all that what kind of a juridical structure what, what do you, who's in charge of it uh, tasking you guys with doing all this and the being said uh, well it's sort of like what you guys would refer to as god but it's a lot different than you think is what he said <laughs> you know uh and so that so the, the question is you know what do we think about that you know uh in what, what my own personal opinion is uh is that you know the the there's a whole emanationist theory of the origins of our universe that there's an infinite, infinite, and eternal sea of completely undifferentiated consciousness that simply abides. Uh, and that this sea of consciousness enfolded into being the original inchoate quantum field the, the, that then, the, then manifests as either a wave of energy or a, a particle of mass. And it, through a, through a, uh, a, a, a process, uh, a process uh, <clears throat> just unfolds uh, and, and completely replicates itself through mitosis, in effect, to generate the sum total of inchoate quantum fields that reside at the base of material reality. Uh, and that when they got to be a critical mass of these, every single one of which was in direct physical contact with every other one. And then the, at that point, the polarity that bonded them all together just reverses and it generates what we perceive as the Big Bang. And it expands out into the universe. And the microsecond after the, the initiation of that repulsion takes place, it re-reverses itself back into attracting them to each other. But it forms the universe. And it turns out, at the base, a big surprise, it turns out that everything is consciousness. Is that, Jeff is and Emmy, I just want to say I introduce to you, I give to you the lawyer of the future. <laughs> you see, four yeah, years of legal education it does not is not deleterious to your spiritual evolution. Yeah, yeah. and I would say that uh, Jeffrey Mishlov or Danny Sheehan for president and the other as VP. So going forward, we'll be in good hands. <laughs> so that's the secret. That's the secret, you know, and it's the same secret that the churches and synagogues and, and mystics have been keeping from us, but trying to share with us, <laughs> trying to share with us. You know, leaving statues around of people sitting there meditating, getting into this state of unitive consciousness, and they're trying to get through to us, you know, and now they're trying to get through to us coming in from on UFOs, saying, hello, hello, you know, uh, here's the story, you know, uh, so it isn't as though you haven't been told, or at least there haven't been hints of it. So we've got to really get the, the churches and synagogues and temples and, and spiritual communities activated here to start sharing the, the deep secret. You know, uh, and that these this is the same kind of secret that's going to enable you to understand that these other beings understand the same thing. But, you Dandy, know? don't you believe don't you believe that one of the biggest questions on people's minds t today is other than do they exist is are they good or bad? And when you watch a, a Stephen Greer talk about, you know, uh, the the national security state and they're trying to position this so that if you're going to acknowledge that there are UFOs, make sure you understand that they're bad. I mean, Greer even goes as far as to say as, and I think again, you were in this documentary as well, that there are programs, again, by the national security state, whether they're abductions or attempts in, to harm people or to scare them or frighten them so that we get it, they're real. 
but they're bad and we better be afraid and very afraid. Whereas Greer is saying, no, 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 no human has ever been harmed with my CE5 uh, program. Yeah. Well, the, the, the Steve and I have had this conversation, as you might guess, uh, you know, that the, 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 real, the reality is, is that when we understand, <laughs> when we understand the nature of good and evil, <laughs> that, that, that you understand that it, it has to do with the degree to which a given incarnated being is capable of the unit of experience. Uh, and to the degree to which they are, then they realize that the way that people need to conduct themselves is in harmony with the, the, uh, the genuine universe, the way that it actually exists. Uh, and that if you don't know that, if you don't experience that, you continue to engage in conduct that, that mistakenly believes that what's right in front of you is just material and has no spiritual dimension at all, has no consciousness dimension at all, and you live in the darkness. Uh, and if you live in the darkness, you do things that are experienced as evil because they're contrary to the normal harmonics of our universe. Uh, it's contrary to the natural law in, in our universe. Uh, and and that's a, again, it's a it's a, a, not, a knowledge within the spiritual community that that's the nature of evil. Uh, it's the lack of light, you know, uh, and, and that and people engage in conduct out of ignorance, out of both not only a, an intellectual ignorance, but I dare say an experiential ignorance. That, that that until you have the experience, until you have access to the experience itself, you don't have the slightest idea of what they're talking about. <laughs> You know, you, you can you can read the mystics and you say, what the hell are they talking about? You know, because you don't have any experience of it. Uh, and so that what we have to do is get the churches and synagogues and temples and spiritual community to be helping to train all of our people to have this experience. You know, if, if you start to have this experience, you start to get the insight of the relationship of consciousness to the entire material realm. OK, uh, and that's the pathway into enlightenment, you know. Uh, and so that that's what we really need to do. Uh, and and I, I believe that we can do that. Uh, I've had that is the reason that the Jesuit order, you know, uh, allowed me to become special counsel to the first investigation that President Carter asked to have of the UFO issue. So when I was contacted by Dr. Marsha Smith, the head of the Science and Technology Division of the Congressional Research Service and asked to participate as special counsel, in the investigation of, of whether UFOs were real and whether they were part of an extraterrestrial civilization, that that uh, I asked for permission from my Jesuit superiors, you know, uh, to I was a candidate for the Jesuit priesthood at that point, uh, primarily because I was the only person in the Jesuit headquarters who wasn't a priest. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was I was their lawyer, I guess. Worse yet, you know, uh, but but that's that's how I that's how I started becoming professionally involved in this. You know, and how I got to get access to the Project Blue Book classified portions. I saw the photographs of crash retrieval. And so I said, wow, Lord, do you know, there it is. It's absolutely real. Uh, and so that what I had assumed that I had intuited from the time that I was basically five years old and got to sit out in my yard for the first time and see the stars. And I realized that these are stars. These are these are suns of other solar systems and there's other planets going around them. And there's other beings. There's someone sitting out in their their yard, looking up at our star in this in their sky, you know, wondering about us. You know? And so that so that, that I I always thought that from the moment that I realized that, I thought that the kind of things that we would do to each other as human beings were completely irrational. Uh, it didn't make any sense in light of what the larger reality really was, that we were conducting ourselves in the dark. Uh, and so that I that was the reason I wanted to be an uh, started out to wanting to be an astronomer. Then I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, that uh, I ended up becoming a lawyer, uh, working on these particular issues. Uh, and so that I have some relationship with the juridical structures now, the Congress and the courts and the the executive branch, etc. Uh, and I'm working our way to this. And I have a certain relationship with the religious institutions from having been general counsel at the Jesuit headquarters in their social ministry office. So I, th I think this is a spiritual endeavor uh, that we're engaged in here. And, and, I, and I think that the, the quest to understand this uh, is one that is not 
exclusively an intellectual endeavor. Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual endeavor that we have to we have to learn what the secrets are that have been laid out in front of us that are spread all around us about how we get access to this higher experience, uh, this unitive experience that is the source of knowledge of good and evil, you know, uh, and, and what kind of conduct. I, 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 I told this story a couple of times that when I when back in 1968, you know, I, I graduated from Harvard College in 67 uh, and went over to the law, went up to the law school. And I was there in the spring of 68, uh, the famous 1968, you know, that I was there when uh, the word came out that Crane Brinton, uh, who was the head of the Department of, of uh, Intellectual History at Harvard University, had been there for 50 years, was going to be uh, uh, having his final lecture to his class. And they invited the people from all around the world who had been in his class over the periods of 50 years to come to be there. So I just walked over from the law school, went into the into the lecture, and he gets up and he said, uh, uh, I've been asked here in my final lecture after 50 years of teaching intellectual history at Harvard to answer the question of what is the most important single intellectual insight that our human family has come to that I have encountered. And he said, this is actually easy. He said, the answer to that is, is that I think the greatest minds in our human family have all come to realize that our human species is right on the very brink of experiencing the next step in our biological evolution and that we're going to be developing a an additional faculty a faculty like seeing or hearing that is able to directly experientially encounter a particular electromagnetic frequency like light uh, has raised up the the complex eyeballs in living beings uh, in the vibrational frequency of sound has, has instigated the creation of ears that are capable of directly experiencing that. It's not a thought process. It's a direct immediate experience. Uh, and he said, I believe that we are uh, in that the, the faculty that is going to be the characteristic of the next step in our biological evolution is the development of a faculty which is able to directly and experientially encounter the unitive phenomenon that bonds every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire physical universe into one unified harmonic whole. He said, and by dint of the experience of that encounter, that each individual human being will realize what conduct on the part of human beings, either individual or collective, is either harmonious with or disharmonious to the natural order of our universe. And he said, and I think that's why so many of you young men refuse to go fight in this war in Vietnam. Hmm. That's what he said. Hmm. So I said, wow. I said, this is, this is the chairman of the Department of Intellectual History at Harvard University. Uh, nobody's going to be able to talk me out of talking about this. You know, and so I began talking about it at law school and asking questions. And they would say things like, uh, Mr. Sheehan, if you need an answer to a question like that, you ought to go over to the Divinity School. Uh, well, it turns out I did. Uh, after I got the law degree, they went out practicing and went back to the Divinity School and started studying about this stuff. And that's where I got recruited uh, uh, to become the legal counsel for the Jesuit National Headquarters in their social ministry office. Mm. So that's. That's why I think this is a spiritual endeavor that we're engaged in here. Mm -hmm. We have a comment slash question from Thomas Brophy, who I believe has been a guest on New Thinking Aloud, Jeff, mm -hmm. and is the incoming president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And he says, regarding disclosure, mm -hmm. it may be complicated that whatever the reality that may be disclosed is not well-defined and not easy to even articulate exactly what it is. Well, it's, uh, you know, the, I guess we're, we're all going to, ah, you mean it might be ineffable? <laughs> it's, I guess it's an inside joke, you know, but I mean, the, the whole the whole debate that goes on between Eastern mystical traditions and Western religious culture is, you know, is this, is the knowledge of all of this really ineffable? Uh, that it's an experience that you can't really articulate because our our verbal articulations have all been rooted in the experience of material reality. Uh, and so therefore, this is a numinous experience uh, in that you, you can't really articulate it because we don't have the verbiage to really articulate it. Uh, uh, but, the, but the fact is, uh, the members of our human family have been taking passes at this for some time. 
<laughs> there's an awful lot of ink spilled uh, on this particular issue and a lot of discussions, a lot of esoteric conversations, you know, but, but, uh, uh, but I, I remember that uh, I guess it was uh, uh, Pir Nasser Al-Shah that I was uh, talking with Pir Nasser Al-Shah one time. Uh, and, and when I asked him this question, he, he did this, he, he went, Mm-hmm. So that's how you that's how you find out. You know, you don't talk your way to it. You don't actually think your way to it. Even though there's one whole tradition of Buddhism uh, that that believes you can kind of get at this kind of intellectually. Uh, but but the bottom the bottom line is that this this uh, doesn't necessarily remain permanently ineffable. This is something that that we can actually come to experience and come to know. And there's there's enough time has been spent by certain percentages of our human family on trying to express this issue to each other that, that I believe there's some degree of efficacy in trying to talk about this. Uh, but the, but it, it, it based the important thing is for people to sit down, breathe deeply, breathe carefully, uh, pay attention uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I think that the experiments that were done at Downstate Medical Center, uh, uh, I think back in the 1965-66, there were a set of experiments where they uh, where they brought in uh, mystics from different traditions, Trappist monk, a, a Zen Buddhist, you know, a, a Hindu faker. They they brought these <laughs> beings in and they put the, they put them in this little like phone booth thing, and they had these uh, uh, cilia, these little fine uh, finer than hair, uh, thick kind of uh, electromagnetic detectors uh, that were in this thing. And they asked the people, they said, here, get in this little booth. And they had the, they had the, they, uh, they had them that all hooked up to a computer that could discern the differentiation uh, in the energy fields between each of these little cilia. Uh, and they, they also had them hooked up to electroencephalograms and electrocardiograms. This is a very Western approach to the whole thing. Uh, and they said, here, each of you get in this uh, this little booth uh, and and do that do that thing do that thing that you guys do, you know. And so it turns out that that every single one of them that when they got in the little booth they would either sit down, squat down, kneel down. They would get into a position where their their spine was completely erect. Uh, number one, and then every one of them would start to uh, like do this kind of uh, singing or praying or this like uh, breathing, what, what they would do is they would do this certain kind of incantation of some sort, whether it's Hail Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners, not the of our death, amen, Holy Mary, Mother of God, or, or you know, uh, uh, whatever they would. And so the bottom line is that, so they would all start doing something like that. And then thirdly, what they discovered is that virtually all of them uh, ended up through this process of expelling all of their breath and then refilling their lungs at a particular ratio that was almost identical to all of them. <laughs> and then the fourth thing that they noticed happened is the, the alpha uh, waves uh, in their brain would start to increase. Uh, and that they, that this, they would start to pick up this brainwave activity. And then, very interestingly, the, the uh, photoplasma around their body that was registrable in all these little cilia, the little electromagnetic differentiation around their body would start to expand. Uh, and the, because they had all this cilia all around them, they could discern the shape of this energy field around the human body. And they discovered that the center of it was inside the person. Like it was like inside somewhere around their solar, between their solar plexus and their heart, there was this center. Uh, and that, that, that what would happen is, when they were when they were breathing, they could see that this energy field was was expanding, uh, and that what happened is that the the energy field was kind of pulsing uh, in this kind of very uh, similar way, uh, and and that that what happened is eventually the rate of pulsation of the energy field around their body fell into direct sync with their heartbeat, <laughs> and they just sat there in, in this state. Uh, and the, the, the scientists were all completely puzzled by this. Uh, and what they finally concluded is what they figured out is that somehow our human body was functioning like a crystal set, you know, a crystal radio set 
that could actually link into and establish some kind of sympathetic resonance with the vibrational frequency of the unit of phenomenon that bonds every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the universe into one unified harmonic whole. And you just sit in the middle of this and you get the download. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, I imagine the Central Intelligence Agency tried to figure out how they could do this to spy on people. <laughs> you know, but but the but the bottom line is that this is something that our human species is capable of, you know, uh, and and it is the source of all knowing. It is the source of discerning right and wrong, uh, and and uh, and to the degree to which we can articulate it in any kind of way uh, is important. Uh, but the the fact of the matter is that the the churches and synagogues and temples and spiritual communities uh, have an inkling of this. They 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 know something. Uh, and interestingly enough, it has a lot to do with what it is that an other sentient, intelligent species would be able to figure out, you know, uh, if they, especially if they've had another couple billion years of time to work on it. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's, that's uh, part of what's going on here. And, and the, the, the average level of our consciousness of our human family uh, is not as high as it should be right now. Uh, Ergo, you know, we have the state of Israel carpet bombing the poor people in, in Gaza into oblivion. We got, you know, people uh, in the Ukraine on both sides, you know, wallowing around in trenches that are half up to their knees filled with water with rats shooting missiles at each other. Uh, you know, and, the, and the people are all going, gee, I wonder why it is that the UFO people don't just come on down here uh, and just sit down and have a little conversation with us. You know, uh, I would say, well, you know, just like you don't get in the middle of a street fight, you know, if you're walking along the street and there's two guys punching each other out, you don't go over and say, come on, guys, uh, why, don't, why don't you let me settle this thing for you? You know, you just stay away from it because you're going to get punched out. So the, the bottom line is that this is the situation I think that we're, we're facing. So we, we've set up the New Paradigm Institute uh, there in Washington to start taking in as much of the information as we can. Uh, trying to share it with the people. Uh, we were prepared that if, in fact, the full 64-page bill had passed in this review board had been set up, uh, as they started to release information uh, that was being uh, extracted from the legacy group, we're, we're, we're prepared to share it with the people in the world uh, in as clear a way as we possibly can. Uh, and we can also try to make sure that we're watchdogging uh, the Congress that's overseeing the process to make sure they're extracting the information. Uh, we're going to oversee the activities of all six of the United States military services that have been ordered to cough the information up that they have. You know, all 18 of the United States intelligence uh, agencies, you know, all 32 of the United States Defense Department agencies in all of the aerospace, private aerospace uh, corporations that have any of this technology to cough that information up and get it on over to the National Archives uh, and so that Congress can get to see it. You know, that, that's part of what we're doing. But at the same time, our, our, one of our objectives is, is try to help work on uh, instigating these conversations among our people uh, about what they think the philosophical, theological uh, implications are uh, of this realization. Not only that there's a lot more going on than we ever thought, but it turns out that even with regard to us, there's a lot more going on than we had even thought. <laughs> that, that's 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 what we that's what we want to be able to do at the New Paradigm Institute. dot org. <laughs> New Paradigm Institute. dot org. Yes. Well, uh, we've uh, run out of our scheduled time, Danny. This has been a fabulous conversation. I uh, hope that you come back to New Thinking Allow many more times over the next four years. I'm sure we have much to talk about. I'm, I'm delighted with your emphasis on, on consciousness and mystical consciousness at the heart of uh, the whole disclosure experience that our civilization globally is, is undergoing now. And so on behalf of uh, Emmy and uh, Christopher, I want to thank you so much uh, for being with us today and with the New Thinking Aloud audience. Terrific. It's a privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate it. Emmy, you're muted. 
Thank you, Jeff. I was just going to say, Danny, thank you. It feels like you're just getting warmed up. So I hope we can have you back many times. Thank you for being with us today. And for those of you listening, said, oh, go ahead, Danny. I'm saying there is more to be said, I guess, on the subject. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll do it. We can do it later. Yeah, we're just getting warmed up. It feels like, it does feel like we, could go for another we, 90 minutes. we will do more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us because you are the reason that we are here.